Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gil Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Eric Verdin. Dr. Verdin is the president and chief executive officer of the Buck Institute of Research on Aging. A native of Belgium, Dr. Verdin received his doctorate of medicine from the University of Liege and completed additional clinical and research training at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Verdin studies how metabolism, diet, and small molecules regulate the activity of HDACs and sirtuins, and thereby the aging process and its associated diseases, including Alzheimer's. In addition, Dr. Verdon has extensive experience working with and founding biotech companies and serving on many scientific advisory boards. Thank you so much for being here today. Good afternoon, Ashley. Good to be here. So, Eric, it's first, it's a pleasure to have you. And usually we start the discussion by asking a bit about your background and uh, especially for our non-scientific audience to explain how someone decided to become a scientist and later on be a professor and uh, leading a so important institute that studied aging as yourself. So it will be fascinating for them to hear your story. Yes, that, good afternoon, Gil. Good, good to see you too. So in my case, it's, it, you know, the, the direction of my professional life being in science came easy. I, I, I still remember very distinctly sort of one of these defining events during my childhood. When I was eight years old, I went to a birthday party of a friend who had just gotten a microscope and we spent the afternoon watching crystals. And I was just completely taken by, by the experience of looking at the world from a perspective that I had never seen. And um, if you've never seen that, you know, copper crystals or uh, other crystals under a microscope, it, it, is, it is pretty amazing to see that this is actually existing. And so from that, from that day on, I just decided I wanted to be a scientist. And, and then, you know, first wanted to be a physicist, an astrophysicist. That was originally the desire. And then through, you know, adolescent years from my reading. I had a, a subscription to the Scientific American throughout my teenage years and became more and more interested in biology and eventually decided to pursue an, a career actually in, in biomedical research. And I took a somewhat unorthodox way to do this since we did not have PhDs, uh, MD PhDs in, in Belgium. I went through medical school with the intent of doing biomedical research. And, and so went to, bio, to medical school in Belgium, did research throughout medical school, and, and after, right after medical school, joined uh, a lab at Harvard Medical School with Ron Kahn, where I essentially got my more, sort of more formal training. I was called a postdoc, but in, in essence, I was a student. Uh, I spent four years in his lab and, uh, and then launched my own career. Very interesting. And uh, one anecdote, uh, I done my PhD at the Weizmann Institute of Science at the lab of Moshe Oron, which is one of the leaders in uh, actually cancer research. And the uh, similar story like you, uh, um, a physician came to the lab and started to do fellowship. And then everyone is asking him, okay, are you doing a PhD right now? And after a year, he, he get a, a tired of all the questions and say, okay, I'll do a PhD. So he become MD, PhD, exactly like you, because he said, I, I don't know how to explain to them that I'm MD and doing a fellowship. Yes. So that was really funny. Anyway, uh, I, I wanted to also to focus a bit about the early days of the CIR2 uh, family of uh, dead satellites. Just as a background, I joined uh, Lenny's lab as a postdoc at 2002. And when I came there, all the human uh, CIR2 homologue were already uh, a sequence and cloned, 
and I know that it was a lot of uh, your work to do that. So it will be fascinating for me to hear the story from your angle and not only from uh, Lenny's angle. So it will be interesting to hear it. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I've always said that I love about a career in basic biomedical research is, in contrast to a career in industry, is the, the freedom that, that you have to, to sort of sometimes go with the flow and sometimes go where, where you want, not someone else. And I, I think that, to me, that's been one of the greatest joys of my career is the, the ability to sometimes just follow what seems exciting. And a very clear example of this happened. So before working on aging, we, my lab was known for cloning HDACs. So we were working on HIV transcriptional regulation and, and in particular, the epigenetic regulation of HIV transcription. And this work led us to, to show that HIV as a, as a gene was, was controlled by histone deacetylases. And the problem at the time is we only had HDAC inhibitors. We did not have, we did not have any, you know, any HDACs identified. And, you know, we knew butyrate, trichostatin, tropoxin were known HDAC inhibitors. And they, they really had a very powerful effect on gene expression on HIV. And so, so we were hunting for HDACs and eventually we cloned HDAC3, HDAC4, 5, 6, and 7. And, and so my lab was working in, in the field of epigenetics and trying to understand, you know, the cofactors and the role of, of all of these epigenetic regulators. And I was obviously following the literature and I saw the paper from, from Lenny talking about SIR2 being a gene involved uh, in aging. And, and so this was fascinating because being in the field, I knew that the knockouts for SIR2 and yeast had hyperacetylated histones. And so people suspected that maybe a SIR2 was a, was a histone deacetylase, but I, there were some problems with showing this because once you isolated the protein, you, no one could demonstrate an activity. And, and so when the, the link with aging came, I, you know, and became excited again to really trying to see, okay, can we actually find these proteins to be epigenetic regulators? And, and the way, so we went about this, I had a new uh, student in the lab, Brian North, who went and, and cloned actually the, the, the human uh, sirtuins. So the human genome had just become available. I think this was around 2000 or 2001. And so, you know, we did something simple. We went to look into the genome using the the coding sequence for the the, the, deacet, the protein deacetylase and, and eventually found seven proteins that Brian cloned. And, you know, some of the really interesting data that came out of this was, in the meantime, Shinimai and, and Lenny actually published a second paper showing that a SIR2 was indeed a protein deacetylase or histone deacetylase, but it was dependent on NAD. And so the combination of all of these factors, our interest in epigenetic regulation, the fact that now you had a, an epigenetic regulator that was a protein deacetylase that was involved in aging, we thought, you know, this is going to be a really exciting field to work in. So Brian cloned the, 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 the human sirtuins, and, you know, we were amazed by what we found because the first thing we did was to link them to GFP, and, and we found some of them in the nucleus, so T, you know, the one we call SIRT1 today and SIRT6 and 7, but we also found three in the mitochondria, and that was quite interesting. So that was sort of three, four, and five, and and we we've been sp spending quite a bit of time. So this took us away from the whole epigenetic model, but we knew that these proteins were involved in aging. So the fact that there was a contribution in the mitochondria sounded very interesting, and so we were the first one to report that sort of three was a, a mitochondrial protein deacetylase. We also found SIRT2 was pr predominantly in the cytoplasm, and Brian was able to show that it functioned as a, as a tubulin deacetylase. By the way, tubulin was the second protein to be identified as an acetylated protein. So all of this just made a case for really interesting biology and that is still ongoing right now. We're still quite involved in, in working on SIRT3 and SIRT5. These are the two that we are focusing on now. That's really fascinating to hear it from your angle. And just for our audience, GFP is a green fluorescent protein. It's basically a tag that you had to a protein, and that's allow you to find where is it located because it's fluorescent. 
and it's a, a, an amazing tool that actually started, I would say, the late 1990. Before Mark, that, we haven't had Shafi, it. Shafi got the Nobel Prize for doing that experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's looked like it's ages ago, but it's only like 25 years ago. It's, exactly. it's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, all right. So next up, I'd love for uh, you to perhaps describe some of the concepts related to hallmarks of aging, especially if there are certain hallmarks that you found in your career, or certainly as the CEO of the Buck Institute now that you found to be particularly important? Yes, actually, I, you know, I won't go through the list of all the hallmarks of aging, but the, the two that, the, that we have particularly been interested in are nutrient sensing and, and epigenetic regulation, and, and especially the, re, the relationship between those two. And so when you think about nutrient sensing, it's the idea that we are, you know, the org any org living organism has the ability to sense food abundance and the nature of food that is coming into the system. And one of them, probably the most fundamental observation in the aging field has been the realization that calorie restriction, decreasing the intake of calorie, uh, really increases lifespan in many species. You know, there, there have been some exceptions to this, like there always is in biology, but in many organisms, many systems, if you restrict calories, you see an increase in lifespan. And contrary, you know, the opposite to this is obesity, which we know in some way looks like an, a form of accelerated aging of when people are actually uh, become obese. So we've been fascinated by trying to understand what is the link between calorie intake and epigenetic regulation. And so in some way, the sirtuins are a really good example of what we call nutrient sensors. So they are proteins, as I mentioned in, in a minute ago, that are NAD dependent. So they are able, and NAD is a, think about it as a metabolite that fluctuates as a, as a function of nutritional abundance. And so the, the idea is that the sirtuins by, are, are able to sense the amount of NAD and this amount of NAD dictates their activity. So, and, and so they really, we think they really act as a, as a link between nutrients and between changes in the activity of the protein. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some sirtuins are epigenetic regulators. So here you have a link between the environment and epigenetic modification. So by removing these acetyl groups from histones, the sirtuins are able to change gene expression and, and, and programs. And actually, as we know, they exert a predominantly sort of a protective activity against the manifestation of aging. And, but we added another dimension to this, which is the sirtuins that are in the mitochondria are also sensing the, the changes in NAD. So you have, a, you know, one single metabolite NAD is able to, to target multiple proteins, which exerts the activities in, in multiple cellular compartments. And so, you know, the two, so our model, I think what the work, the lab has been working on is really trying to identify multiple sort of couples and one couple being NAD and sirtuins. We have worked also on acetyl-CoA. Uh, think about it, acetyl-CoA is the opposite of uh, NAD. Acetyl-CoA level rise with food abundance. They go down with food restriction. And acetyl-CoA targets the proteins that do the opposite of what the sirtuins are doing. They actually target proteins that are called acetyl transferases, histone acetyl transferases. And we've shown that this interaction between the sirtuins and the acetyl transferases exists exist in an equilibrium which is doubly dependent on nutrient inputs, basically. And we published a, a, a paper actually a couple of years ago, show, actually more than four years ago, showing that NDGA, which is neurodihydroguaretic acid, which has been identified independently as a molecule that increases lifespan, is actually an inhibitor of, of P300, which is a key acetyl transferase. So we think that there is a, there's a pair here, a competition between sirtuins and histone acetyl transferase that, again, targets epigenetic modification and, again, represents the link between the nutrients, what, what comes in, in, in the food, and the epigenetic modification. Now, one more thing that we are particularly interested in is, you know, other pairs, such as the one that I just described. And there is work now ongoing 
in my lab also on beta hydroxybutyrate mm. and classical HDAX. So it turns out the first inhibitor of HDAX that was identified was butyrate, and which is a product uh, normally made by bacteria. And we, we always wondered what beta hydroxybutyrate, which is a hydroxylated form of butyrate, which itself is a product of the ketogenic diet. We wondered, you know, what does that do in terms of HDAC activity? And we, were, we published a paper about 10 years ago showing that uh, it is an inhibitor. So beta hydroxybutyrate, the, the major ketone body, uh, inhibits HDACs and again targets uh, a series of reactions which are protective. There, there are a number of papers that are actually linking the activity of the HDACs, the classical HDACs and the sirtuins. And we think that genetically in Drosophila, this has been uh, reported by Steve Helfand and colleagues. And we think that we have the, this has been shown in fly. Uh, we think uh, we have the equivalent system in, in, in mammalian systems, and which could explain one of the, the ways by which a ketogenic diet have a protective effect against health span. We, we published a paper two years ago showing that uh, animals on a ketogenic diet actually have a pretty dramatically increased health span. So uh, there are many more of these pairs. Uh, another pair that of metabolite with an epigenetic regulators is alpha ketoglutarate that was recently published by Brian Kennedy and Gordon Lithgow. He had the buck uh, and this product actually alpha calcium alpha ketoglutarate is already commercialized. There's s methionine and all the methyl transferases. And I think there's going to be more and more. So the idea is that the cells are able to sense you know, their environment largely through metabolites. And so the, the interface between metabolites and epigenetic regulators for me is really what, what passions me. And I think we're going to be continuing to work on this. One, one, one point that I want to mention, just cl clarification for our audience, HDAC are histone deacetylase, uh, and they are a normal histone deacetylase, and then they are the CIR2 family that uh, actually NAD dependent deacetylase. So just for the non scientific audience. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, actually. Please remind me that uh, I'm talking to a lay audience. So, although yeah. I know that I suspect that many of the people that you have listening to this, this podcast are, are highly sophisticated in terms of their understanding of biology. Yeah, yeah, they are, they are definitely. <laughs> Now I feel like you can see all sorts of beta hydroxybutyrate supplements that are on the market. And I'm curious if there is any research like that, or if you see that going the way of uh, alpha ketoglutarate that Dr. Kennedy researched. So that, that's a good point. And uh, so what, what our data shows is beta hydroxybutyrate. So this is the major ketone body. There are, there are three, there are two others, acetoacetate and acetone. But the major one, which is present in millimolar concentrations in your blood uh, when you fast, has, is not only, uh, has two different properties. One, it is a nutrient. That is, it's a form of energy. Think about it, uh, something in between a carbohydrate and, and a lipid. But it also has signaling properties. And this is what I alluded to. So the signaling properties of, of, of metabolites is clearly in the case of, by inhibiting the HDAC, it modifies the epigenetic landscape. And so... There are multiple ways in which you can uh, enter a state of ketosis. One way is to fast. Uh, so if you, you know, go on a water-only diet, within 16 to 18 hours, you will see ketone bodies appearing in the blood. You can recognize this in someone's breath. The, the breath becomes fruity because of the acetone that you ex excrete uh, as a gas. But so obviously, you know, if you go on a prolonged fast and you go, you know, people have shown, you know, on a 10 day fast, you can have beta hydroxybutyrate level go up to 10, 15 millimolar, extremely high. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not something that you want to do every day. So people have looked for alternative manners in which to induce ketosis. And there is a way to do this without fasting, which is simply by a carbohydrate restriction. And so if you cut down your, your carbohydrate by less than to less than about 15 grams per day, which would be the equivalent of an apple a day, over time, you will enter ketosis. Now, there's a third way. And so, you know, we have all kinds of ketogenic diets that are available. The, the one that many of you are probably are familiar with was, was the Atkins diet, which started in the 70s and got a, a bad name and a bad reputation because... It was argued that people should stop eating carbohydrate and replace this by 
greasy meat essentially which uh, <laughs> i'm not sure is totally healthy but there are there are other ways to enter ketosis and and to conduct a, a ketogenic diet without eating highly saturated fat and, and there are lots of books and advice on this and i, I think I, I go periodically on this type of diet and i find it is it is a diet that feels extremely healthy in terms of in terms of brain uh, function now the third way to go to uh, into ketosis is by eating or absorbing directly beta hydroxybutyrate itself and uh, there are a number of products that you can buy right now beta hydroxybutyrate salt there are all kinds of problems with those. One is beta hydroxybutyrate is a very short-lived metabolite. So if you eat, you know, if you eat it at T0 within an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, it will be gone. The second is it has to be absorbed as a salt, and and which means that either you know people have an excess of magnesium, so you can see or citrate or sodium, and so that this brings a number of problems. So if you've seen uh, beta hydroxybutyrate salts on, on Amazon, uh, I would argue that this is probably not a very healthy way to, uh, to enter ketosis. And so to address this, we, we've generated a novel ketone body esters that actually are commercially available now. I don't, don't know if it's appropriate for me to plug in a product that, I've, <laughs> that I have developed, but there's a product on, online called Metabolic Switch. This is a product that we, this is a molecule that I designed a number of years ago, actually five years ago. And what it is, it is a hybrid, an ester between beta hydroxybutyrate and a fatty acid. And so what this does is allows you to eliminate the salt problem. This, this ester is absorbed and it gets slowly hydrolyzed which releases beta hydroxybutyrate, which raises your ketosis immediately. So if you take the, the recommended dose within 30 minutes, you will be at about one millimolar uh, ketosis. And on the other hand, the short fatty acid that we have linked goes to the liver where it can be used to, to generate de novo beta hydroxybutyrate. So you have a little bit of a, a delayed effect. And when you take a dose of this beta hydroxybutyrate ester, you actually, you will enter ketosis and you will remain there for four to six hours. And so, the, you know, we, we've seen, you know, the, I mean, we have documented the product is sold. It actually does work. And it's an interesting experiment, experiment to conduct if you've never felt what ketosis is. If you have fasted for three days, people describe that after three days, you have a clarity. First, you, you lose your hunger and you have this feeling of, of deep clarity. And this is recapitulated simply by absorbing the ester. So we're quite excited by the product. There is a significant barrier to this product, which is its taste, which is absolutely <laughs> horrible. And uh, I'll tell you, we, I, we've, I found personally that uh, if you, if you, if you like kombucha, uh, a glass of ginger kombucha right after erases the taste. So it actually allows one to deal with, with this issue. So Eric, clarification question about that. So you can take this product and continue to eat your normal diet or you need to adjust yeah. your diet? You don't need to adjust your diet. That, that's the, the beauty of it. So you can be in a ketosis and eat anything you want. Yeah. And, and you know, frankly, one of the things that one of the, the, the effects that we've seen, this is still early. The product went, went on the market about six months ago is a loss of appetite. So mm. we've, I'm not sure that this is something I would recommend to someone who is you know, fully healthy and exercising and, and doing everything they do. But we've seen a um, really dramatic effect in obesity. So people losing weight. And frankly, the ketogenic diet has been used as a, as a very efficient tool for people to lose weight. And we've never really understood why it was working so well. And this is one of the reasons for the popularity of the diet today. But we, I, I've experienced it myself. If, if I take uh, metabolic switch, my appetite goes away completely. It's actually very strange. And so we'll see. We'll see. You know, the one thing that I should say also, I was hesitant at first to sell this as a supplement because I, I really, you know, as a physician, I, I believe in, you know, in, in evidence-based type of product. But we are currently, we will be conducting clinical trials for specific indications, because we think 
we know there might be a group of patients, for example, obese individuals or someone with type 2 diabetes who might be interested in taking this chronically today, even without a clinical trial. I want to demonstrate the efficacy. And so we're looking at a number of potential indications where these compounds could be tested using the, you know, the standard tools of a, of a clinical trial to determine whether they actually are efficacious. Uh, simply based on anecdotal evidence, we know they're safe. They, we went through a, an approval process with, with the government for so-called grass approval. So we know the products are safe. Now we want to demonstrate their efficacy. And I think these, these studies are ongoing. And have you done any study on the animals to show what is the effect on the longevity? Yeah, we have not done a longevity. I, I did a longevity experiment in mice on a ketogenic diet. And when I was finished with it, I swore that I would never do a, a, a longevity experiment in mice again, because it is a lot of work. It's very expensive and, and it's tedious. And you know, it's hard to recruit a good postdoc to do a longevity trial. But I, I think in the case of these esters, We've, we have tested them in a, in a number of models for Alzheimer's disease in mice. And we have a paper that is uh, in preparation with John Newman, I should say. A lot, of, a lot of the work on the ketone body has been done with another collaboration between John Newman's lab here at the Buck and, and my laboratory. Interesting. And, and Eric, I think that the, the ketogenic diet is a a very uh, interesting subject that a lot of our audience are asking us a lot of questions. So uh, I see, uh, from what I heard from you, there are two different avenues. One is to take the compound, and another one that you alluded before that you done in the past is uh, basically to cut down as much as you can carbohydrate. And you said that you done it before, so it will be a very beneficial for us to hear from you what was the method that you used because you can do it in a, a lot of different methods yeah so as i mentioned i think if you look at the literature on atkins diet and ketogenic diet this got a, a bad a bad name uh, for basically decreasing carbohydrate and substituting by saturated fat but there are ways you know i i I, I, if I can sort of reference a book, for example, that I read that helped me a lot, it's called Ketotarian. I don't remember the author, but the essence of that book was a, almost a vegetarian ketogenic diet. Now, to go and to enter ketosis is a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. There's a process, almost like a switch. And this is why actually we, we call our product Metabolic Switch, because the entry into ketosis is not always super easy, especially if you don't fast. So if you restrict carbohydrate, it might take you two or three or four days for you to enter ketosis. Uh, the good news is that there are a blood meter that you can buy on Amazon that will measure your ketone body levels. And, you know, the first thing, if you're intrigued or interested in trying, is just to go on a, on a water only fast. If you go on a probably 20 to 24 hour fast, you will definitely see ketosis appear. And then it might be actually easier to go back on a regular diet with, with very little carbohydrate. So there's almost like an induction phase in which you either fast or you can take the ketone body ester that we have that generates almost instant ketosis. And what we've seen is that at least personal experience and other people, this induction phase is quite often the hardest phase to go through. Once you are... Uh, you've established your routine and you limit your carbohydrate, most people are able to stay in, in very high level of ketosis, you know, from 0.5 to 1 millimolar over extended period of time. The, the interesting thing that, that we did when we did our trial in mice, we fed them zero carbohydrate. So these mice never saw carbohydrate, which is, you know, quite interesting. Actually, we were feeding them Crisco which is not really, not a very healthy fat, but despite this, they were actually quite healthy and vibrant. And uh, so it, I think in, in humans, there's a lot of literature. There, there are a lot of websites that really explain how to do this. There are companies that are commercializing, sort of helping people to get on a ketogenic diet. And with, frankly, with remarkable effects in terms of type 2 diabetes, in terms of glycemic control, and in terms of many, many of the markers of aging. Yeah, and just to uh, discuss the popularity of a ketogenic diet, uh, Abu that uh, uh, produced the uh, freestyle uh, continuous glucose monitor, 
uh, announced in January that we are going now to develop uh, something like that for keto bodies. So uh, most likely in 2023, we will have like a continuous glucose keto body, keto bodies monitor that will be available for the end consumer. So if they are going there, it sounds like there is a very big market for that. I, I love this idea because it's uh, frankly, you know, whatever you can measure, it just uh, there, there already are a number of products on the market, one based on, uh, on your respiratory quotient, measuring, you know, the amount of CO2 versus oxygen that you are actually excreting. Uh, the bottom line, if, you know, if you, if your RQ ratio is, 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 is around, you know, 0.7, you're most likely oxidizing fat and you are most likely uh, making ketone bodies. So yeah. I think that's another way that you can measure this. Uh, but right now there are ketone body met meters that you can just buy on Amazon. It will give you a good idea. But having the, the continuous would be amazing. Is it so the same company that makes the freestyle? Um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And they are, they are working on a direct to consumer uh, solution. They announced it at a, a CES. They actually the CEO for Abu they announced it. Nice. And, and uh, yeah. yeah they, it, it will be interesting to see it. So I've been wearing actually uh, the Freestyle CGM, the Libre. That's one yeah. of the one you're referring to for, yeah. for, for a number of years. And one of the things that I have noticed, and actually many people have noticed this and have published on it as well, is that the ketone body esters, when you enter ketosis, your blood sugar drops. In my case, sometimes close to 20 milligrams per deciliter. It's wow. actually it's pretty impressive. And yeah. uh, so that, you know, you know, people always ask me, how should I take this thing? And I've argued, you know, it's, it's a bit tough on the stomach. So you should not do this without, without, you know, without food. And one of the things that we've seen, many of us who have tested it, is that you will actually suppress the post-glycemic excursion that you mm -hmm. see, for example, if you take like a bowl of oatmeal, which generally would spike my blood sugar, if I take it with a ketone body ester, you can suppress the increase in glycemia. And... You know, there's a lot of the reason I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about CGM is it is really one of the first true sort of real time metabolic measurement that we have. And having experimented with this personally, I, I've been I've been astounded by what I've discovered in terms of what food is, you know, what foods are affecting my blood sugar. I don't know if you've had Iran Segal on your on your on we your we had we had we had him uh, we haven't uh, released it yet yeah but uh, he will be out soon a bit before yeah. you i assume because we already interviewed him yeah good well iran's work was really instrumental in in you know, a lot of what we we've been thinking about this idea that you know everyone focuses in terms of glycemia on the your the level of your glycemia, which is reflected in your hemoglobin A1C. Yeah. I mean, that's a good marker, but it turns out that the post-meal post glucose excursion is equally important and, and can be sometimes very different from your A1C. And yeah. it's also a high, highly predictive of your, your disease, uh, particularly macrovascular disease risk factor. And I appreciate you mentioning that there is a healthier way to do ketogenic diet because I feel like what most people see and assume is that all you have to do is cut out carbs and then you can have unlimited amounts of sour cream and butter and cream cheese and cheese and all of these other things that I think also has nudged this like carnivore diet that's currently pretty popular too but I do think there's some redeeming qualities that we can find in vegetables <laughs> and I am curious about your thoughts on the impact of you know if there are specific foods that including them like vegetables can also increase longevity yeah I mean this is a, a tough one as uh, the the epidemiological evidence is clear that highly you know that consuming vegetables of varied colors is is healthy for you and i think you know when you look at what these vegetables are are comprised of i mean there's lots of nutrients that that we know at least in in vitro systems really have profound effect on on the age on aging pathways the problem lies in you know in in how you are being for example vegetarian on how what veg, 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 vegetables you are eating so there's, you know, it's a topic that is that really will bring me to the whole idea of nutrition science. Right now, there is a general consensus that nutrition science in, in the uh, is broken and has generated a lot of information that we frankly do not know how to use. 
so I, 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 you know, what's clear is processed foods are not good. You know, natural foods, uh, uh, you know, based on the healthy vegetables is much more healthy. On the other hand, I, I, I see quite frequently, you know, people who are abstaining from meat and eating vegetarian diets that are laden with sugar. And so, you know, I, I still think, you know, what, if you had to ask me, if, maybe I can transform your question and saying, what is it about nutrition that you think is important? And I, I'm convinced that it's not so much what you eat, but how you eat, you know, and, and how often. And I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussions about whether it is healthier to be a vegan or a vegetarian or pescatarian or anything. So the, the, the few principles that I have is that I think meat is okay, but in moderation. For me, I, I try to use, use meat as a, as a condiment, almost something that just brings incredible amount of taste. And I would be remiss and it would be hard for me to imagine that I will never be able to have a, a sweet Italian sausage or, <laughs> or, or some of the, you know, a, a really nice piece of steak barbecued, but in moderations in small amounts. And, and, and in my case, you know, certainly not more than once a week. So that's number one. So I, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't, I'm not convinced about the evidence of showing that a vegetarian diet is actually healthier than a diet that includes some small amount of meat. Number two is I think there's growing evidence that the amount of carbohydrate in your diet is really one of the major determinants. And so this, the reason why I'm convinced of this is first, the epidemiology is strong. It turns out that, you know, there's an inverse correlation between the amount of carbohydrate in your diet and your longevity. And, and the reason it's, it's so con compelling is that this is one of the major one of the major pathways that's been identified in, in terms of aging in, in many animal models is the insulin signaling pathway, which is directly driven by carbohydrates. We also know that you know, carbohydrate drive inflammation. So there's, there's a lot of compelling uh, sort of molecular mechanism of how this actually could happen. And then finally, you know, so not too much meat, not, no need to exclude it. Number two, decrease your carbohydrate. And number three, incorporate in every one of your day some degree of fasting. And in, in this regard, I am uh, particularly fond of the work of uh, Sachin Panda on, on time-restricted feeding or the work of Walter Longo, you know, the fasting mimicking diet. So, yeah, the, the idea of incorporating your fasting in, into your daily routine or on a visit, a visit episodic time, time course, I think is, is really important because what we know is that the shift between fasting and feeding is really one that promotes um, the maximal metabolic flexibility. And also, you know, if you're thinking about it in very simple terms, I think when I, when I fast, which is what I try to do every day for about 16 hours, so I, I go you know, by what people call this time-restricted feeding, where you're eating only for eight hours a day, and then feeding uh, for sixteen for fasting for sixteen. The, this the sixteen hour period is actually one in which I experience the, the the strongest lucidity in terms of intellectual function. But also I exercise uh, while fasting, and I think it's a it's a time for your body in some way for all of the digestive process, for your intestine, for all of this to to rest and to shift to burning fat and uh, or ketone bodies. Uh, so. I think these are the three, for me, the three elements of what I think we can do today. Obviously, there, there's more coming on. There's supplements that are addressing, you know, the whole nutrient space and, you know, talking about NAD metabolism and, and so on. But I, you know, many of those, frankly, are not proven and I think are still under investigation. So I think that that's how I think about nutrition today. So Eric, a follow-up question related to meat. So now it's very popular to have a meat alternative like impossible meat and the other. What do you think about them? Is it really uh, like eating a, a piece or it's, a, it's more closer to meat in, a, a, let's say, a physiologically to our body? Yeah, so I think it's a good question for me. There's no demonstrated evidence that these actually are more healthy than regular meat. Uh, that's number one. And frankly, I mean, you know, when you look at how some of these actually generate the meat taste is by 
synthesizing myoglobin, uh, which yeah. is a meat, meat, meat protein. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, to me, they are meat-like. The, the real value of these products is by is that they address some environmental concerns that are li linked to meat production. And we know that today, for example, you know, uh, cows, uh, grazing cows are an enormous source of, 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 of the gas, you know, that, that the polluting gas that are contributing to, you know, to global warming. So I think I, I totally am on the side of what people are trying to do with these companies. It's still very early. So we, I don't see, frankly, any reason why they would be less healthy, but I don't see any compelling, compelling reason either why they would be more healthy, particularly if you're going to have one of these hamburgers every day. You know, I, I love a hamburger, but this is something that we have once a month. And, yeah. and so, you know, so again, you know, I, I hate to sound like Michael Pollan, you know, that, you know, everything but in moderation and and you know meat and all meat products for me should be should i mean can be part of a healthy diet but they have to be a, a, a sort of a minimal part of your diet interesting so so uh, we discussed meat we discussed uh, intermittent fasting we, we discussed cut sugar and the question is if we are combining all of that together is a lifestyle so, uh, and uh, my question is about the enigma. What is more important, the genetics or the lifestyle? And if you can quantify it. So that, uh, I can answer that question in, in two ways. Uh, first, if you are a centenarian or if you have a centenarian in your family, a first degree relative, it is like, so if someone, you know, brother or, or parent has lived to above 100 you're likely today to have a very strong genetic component that will protect you. The good news, if you're one of these lucky people, is that we know that many centenarians actually don't, don't adopt very healthy behaviors. I'm sure you've had Nir Barzilai on, 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 your, on your podcast, and he's, he always reminds me that many of the centenarians smoked. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, uh, I remember. I remember from one of his papers to show someone that uh, a lady in one hundred that she is uh, lighting the candle with her cigarette or something. Exactly, like that. I had that slide, and uh, and uh, <laughs> yes, I think and Nir has a good story that you know he one of the patients that he saw he asked you know what, what, why are you smoking? She was one hundred and five, and she said, "Honey, I've, I've had five doctors before you." They all told me to stop smoking and they're all dead. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's, that's the good news if you're a centenarian. If you're not, which is, you know, the rest of us, there, there's a really interesting story came out from, from Calico, the Calico group, where they used the Ancestry.com database to actually try to decipher, you know, where you can actually see where, who died at what age. And you can actually see this across human lineages. And the data that emerged out of that paper was that about 93% of your longevity appears to be determined by lifestyle environmental factors, and only about 7% determined by, by your genes. Now, again, this is in contrast to if you have someone in your, in your family that is a centenarian. Now, I think this is, a, for me, one of the most important papers that's been published recently because it really sort of shifts the onus, the responsibility in terms of your lifespan onto your behavior. And whether you can control them or not, uh, you know, not only your behavior, but the behavior of the politicians who are somewhat creating the environment in which, some, you know, in which we live. And so that means there is incredible hope also in terms of, you know, if you do the right thing, you can maximize your chance for a long life and healthy life. And I, I quite often, you know, use the example. Right now, the average lifespan in, 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 in the U.S. is around 78, 80. But that number really does not reflect the whole, the, the, the full picture, because there's incredible variation across different, different communities, across different strata of the population. And I'll give you some example. There are some areas uh, in the country where life expectancy right now is 67. And there are some areas, actually, I'm fortunate to live in Marin County here, where life expectancy is 87. So there's a, a clear 20-year delta. Just today, 
uh, based, you know, people who are living the healthiest life and people who are, do not. Now, not everything, I should say, is a question of choice, because we know that, you know, the strongest predictor of your lifespan is your zip code, which is reflected by your education level, by your affluence. It's clear that if you're working three jobs to survive and feed your kids, or if you're a single mother, that you're not, you're not going to Whole Food Market and you don't have a Peloton or you don't go to the gym and you don't have the, the, the luxury of actually taking care of yourself. And so there's, there's a clear societal aspect that I think we could do better in terms of really promoting health into everyone. And there's a whole, we could have a, probably a two hour discussion on, on yeah. the subject that I'm fascinated is the whole idea of the social determinants of health. This is a whole field that really tries to address this with politicians. And it's really sad to, to know that uh, basically longevity, you can buy longevity by money. That's what we are saying. Uh -huh. If you have a lot of money and you have time to, as you said, to use your Peloton and you can go to all food and buy the right food, immediately you can live 10 or 12 years longer. But when you are a hard worker and uh, you had not only, it's not only bad genetics, but bad luck, let's say, and you haven't born in the right family, uh, unluckily for you, you live 12 years uh, shorter on, uh, on, uh, on average, which is yeah. very sad for me, at least. Um, I agree for everyone. And I think this is a strong argument for having a society that is more balanced in terms yeah. of what, you know, that everybody gets access to, you know, to the best food and so on. And so the, the good news is also if you are able through your hard work to change your life conditions and to, you know, to be successful. We know that many of the anti-aging interventions actually can be efficient, even if you start later. And, yeah. and so to me, that's, that's the, the, the silver lining. And so it means also that as scientists studying aging, I think I feel an incredible responsibility to really bring this data to the awareness of the politician and there are a number of organizations that are being developed right now whose sole goal is going to be to educate our politicians and, and try to create an environment in which they will understand that you know poverty is not only robbing people of the quality of their life but also of their lives period and i think you know the other thing that I, the other point that i would like to make is the fact that think about a place like marin county where life expectancy is 87 I live here, so I know, you know, the fraction of people who are what I would call optimized. I think about this, you know, when you think about lifestyle, I think of this as sort of a life optimization in which you're taking every one of the variables that we can access and we can change and try to make them better. And there's a lot, there are a lot of people who eat well. There are a lot of people who exercise. People have friends. They have a good community. They have beautiful weather and so on. But at the same time, I would say, I don't think that 50% of the populations are fully optimized. Now, here lies the hope, again, is that imagine a society where everybody would be fully optimized. My, my prediction would be that today, most of us should, be, should expect to live to 90, 95 in good health. And that's, you know, if you go from the 65 that I started with, which is what we see in the most deprived population, to 95 there's 30 years of healthy lifespan. And, you know, some of my colleagues in, in, in the aging field like, you know, to give big numbers about, you know, we're going to live to 150 or we're going to live to 700. And I, <laughs> I, I, have, I have taken a very, what people have called an unimaginative or boring or uninspired view of, of, of our work. But I find the idea that the whole population living to 95 in good health, absolutely incredibly inspiring. And that's just a goal that we can reach today. We certainly have the knowledge, we have the tools. Now the question is how do we transform all of this knowledge into reality? Imagine what society would look like if everyone would live to 95 in good health. I think this would be, you know, there's, there, there would be no bigger transformation that we can actually possibly imagine. And that, that's what we are focusing on, on right now. now I want to say one last thing is that doesn't mean that I'm not excited by the prospect of a much longer lifespan. And I think, you know, that is work that is ongoing in the laboratory today, in my lab, in, in many labs at the back or across the country and, and the world. But it's not here for us now. So 
I, I'm passionate about what, what we can do today to really transform health and, and, and the way we think about aging. So Eric, uh, uh, I think that at least you convinced me and Ashley that uh, <laughs> aging is reversible. And if you take the people from the urban desert and move them to marine country, they <laughs> might live 12 years uh, longer. And I, I agree with you. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, very likely that it will happen. My question is, is it a point that it uh, will be irreversible? Can you take someone in his 80s and uh, move him from the desert to marine country? Or is it uh, the 60 or is it 50? What, what is the age that you can still do it? I would say any age. I have been, you know, I, I've worked with a personal trainer who has told me that he has seen, for example, clients uh, come and, and work with him. And this is anecdotal, so maybe I shouldn't do this as a scientist. But I, I still, anecdotes are quite often the hints that by which we start experiments. And I think the experiment should be done. And he has mentioned that he has had a number of cases of clients who would start at 75, people who had never exercised, who would uh, come and be put on a regimen of three exercise sessions of an hour per week and see transformation where, you know, people who could barely walk, who could barely, you know, there's one thing to understand about the whole aging process is there are a number of cascading consequences that, that can be reverted. And so I, I think even if these people do not end up living longer, I can tell you he has told me that he, has, he saw dramatic changes in terms of their quality of life, their ability to, you know, to move around, to, to carry groceries, to, to be, you know, to have a, a normal, what we call a normal life versus uh, sitting in a chair or in a bed. And so we also know from animal models that interventions, for example, like rapamycin, you can start pretty late. I, from what I remember from one of the studies that was published, they started rapamycin in mice that w would have been the equivalent of a 60-year-old and still saw a, a, a 20 to 30 percent increase in lifespan. So I think, you know, th there is a lot of work going on in this direction right now by many labs, especially in animal models. I think not as much has been done in humans. And I think this is an area that we're passionate about is really... You know, this is the easiest way. If you think about one of the, the biggest challenge of our field of aging research is, you know, we have a lot of ideas of what to do. One of the, the fears uh, or the concerns, especially as a physician, is that let's say, let's take the example of rapamycin. To give rapamycin to someone who is 50 years old, you are assuming you're going to have to give the drug to this person for the next 20 years, 30 years. And so we know the longer you give a drug, the more likely you, you might have side effects and, and, con and, and, and consequences that you cannot anticipate. But imagine the situation of someone who's 75 years old, who is starting to feel an acute sort of functional decline. This is the type of people in which we could first experiment, if they are interested, of course, some of the, the potential of, of some of the interventions that we're thinking about. So I think... My prediction is that this is where we will start giving gyro protectors or gyro reverters or whatever we want to call them. And, and I think, you know, the preliminary data in animal models suggest that aging, you know, of course, there's a terminal point, but might be more reversible than what we thought it is. Yeah. And uh, to add to what you said, uh, first, I, I'm 100% agree with you. We have uh, the luxury at Insta Tracker. We have uh, tens of thousands of humans that uh, have been blood tested and they are blood testing again and again and again. And we see that when they are changing their lifestyle, we can see a, a very nice improvement in the metabolic related marker, uh, uh, lipids and uh, glucose and inflammation markers. Again, we don't, we cannot say that they are living longer, but we at least can see a marker that uh, might suggest that they are living longer. So I, I'm 1% with you. It's, uh, it's no, no time is late to start it and, uh, uh, and invest in your body because that's the most important machine that you have. So it's, uh, it's definitely what we should do. I agree. I agree. And you have mentioned quite a few tips, but is there a top tip that you would recommend if anyone of any age could start like tomorrow? to improve or increase their lifespan or health span? Is there one that stands out? Yes, I'm, I'm really convinced about exercise. And when I say exercise, it is, you know, 
for a lot of people, it means sweating. It means you know going to the gym, things that many people, frankly, do not like. There's incredibly compelling data showing the effect of simple walking. And I, you know, I, I was struck by the whole the whole Fitbit craze with the 10,000 steps. And having you know been one of the early adopters, I, I tested this. You know, to walk 10,000 steps is is you know is a lot of walking every day. Which means that for most people will buy their Fitbit, they will try, they will be successful for a month or two, and then they will get discouraged, and then they will go from 10,000 to 1,200. And so I, you know, I researched a little bit to see where is this 10,000 step coming from. It actually came from an initial app that was like a pedometer, that's something that you could wear on your belt that was sold in Japan in the 50s or 60s. And and they, they were the first one to recommend a 10,000 step. Turns out some colleagues have actually looked at the data, trying to see predict people's longevity as a function of the number of steps. And what they found was actually somewhat different is that most of the benefits of walking actually occurred within the first 5,000 steps. And that's that by itself was a, a remarkable finding because, again, we talked about earlier the realization that most of your longevity is determined by by your activities. Walking five thousand steps a day is is relatively easy, and and so this is part of my routine. You know, take a walk with the dog. In addition to the sports that I do, independently, I just try to do the walking. And I encourage people: if you're not walking at all, start walking fifteen minutes every day. And then 20. And then, you know, typically, you know, I do this with my mother, who is not an exerciser and was complaining, you know, she's 87 and was complaining about aches and pains and, and inflammation and so on. And I, I got her to start walking 15 minutes a day. And it just made an amazing difference, even just on her psyche, on everything. I, I think, you know, medicine, uh, exercising is, is the best anti-aging medicine that we have today, clearly. And Personally, what I try to do is if you're asking me what my tip is, because the, the bottom line is that when I exercise a lot, I can eat anything I want, which is so that eliminates the second variables, almost anything I want. But I, I think I try to combine a variety of exercises that addresses all of the needs that your musculoskeletal system needs. And that would be endurance, car, cardio type of exercise, so the long, long, low level duration. I do some strength training, so you know you don't need much equipment. You don't need a gym. You can just buy, you know, a couple of dumbbells and, uh, and a medicine ball, and this is all you have to to have. And, and there are classes everywhere on YouTube, on you know everywhere you look. There, there is a new class that's free, or you can join a gym if you if you you know if you're more social. I think it's important to include balance. You know, we talked about fancy things in the aging research field, but Typically, people die from falling, which is really, it strikes me to this point that, and they die from falling because they lose proprioceptive sensation in the feet with peripheral neuropathy. They, and they don't train. So your balance is something that you can start training for your whole life, so standing on one foot or doing exercises that are linked to balance. And finally, flexibility. So, you know, I love yoga, Pilates, all of these forms of exercise incorporate a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of balance, a little bit of uh, strength. And so I encourage you know all of your listeners to try to find something that they can stick with. And, and I mean, the quality of their life will clearly increase. Amazing. And those are such great tips because, you know, on our podcast, we talk about awesome cutting edge things um, that are happening in longevity and walking is something that you, know, you don't most of us are can and can access that it's accessible to most people is a great place to start such an amazing conversation i i learned so much and i really appreciate you following our tangents <laughs> I, I i it was fun and so frankly i mean i'm happy to come back just let me know i'm you know where i live <laughs> yeah, we will do that. We also, it was similar with uh, the interview with Neil Barzilai. We, we said at the end, we haven't discussed at all the long-lived human and so fascinating. I, I never met someone above 100. Uh, so it will be fascinating just to, to hear uh, from him about that. And the, the same with you. You have so much, so much that we, w we were planning to ask. So definitely we should uh, invite you again. Okay. My pleasure. It's good to see you both. 
Yes, you too. And we look forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and the leading scientists. For more information, please go to www.insidetracker.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.